Conservative. Constitutional. It's the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, keeping you informed on what's going on right here in Kentucky. And welcome, everybody, to an, another amazing day right here on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show. Of course, I'm your host, Andrew Cooper Writer. As always, head on over to theandrewshow.com. Once again, that's theandrewshow.com to check out past episodes. Make sure you're following along. Make sure you're tuning in every day, Monday through Friday. We've got a big show for you today. I know I say it every day, but that's because I mean it every day when I say this. We'll be covering... Um, you know, a few a few news articles, few bills, some important things moving and going through our legislature. It's an important, important time. Uh, there's a lot going on. I mean, part of the reason why it's such an important time is because we have, well, I think they just had their, I believe Friday was the 42nd day of legislature. So as a reminder, for those of you that don't follow Kentucky politics quite as intently as others, um, that... Every other year, the Kentucky legislature is a longer year on the even years, which is 60 days. And then on the even years, it is, or odd years, sorry, it's a 30-day session. But built into the session, there's always something called uh, a veto period. So pretty much what they do is, is uh, you know, part of the rules, so they have to be out of, on the even years, the long session, the 60-day session, they have to be out of session by uh, April 15th on the short session years, the off years, those odd years where they only are in session for 30 days, they got to be out of session by the end of March. So they have till April 15th. However, what they always work in is a two week veto period. So any legislation of consequence gets passed before the two-week veto period. So that is any pieces of legislation that they think it is possible or they believe that Andy Bashir could potentially veto, they'll pass before the veto period. So the way vetoes work is Andy Bashir can either veto a bill, he can let it sit on his desk for 10 days and um, basically two weeks-ish, which is why it's a two-weeks veto period, uh, but he can let it sit on his desk and... Uh, you know, just languish there. If he doesn't veto it or sign it, it then becomes law without his signature. If he signs it, it becomes law with the signature or he can veto it. And then if he vetoes it, it has to go back to the House and Senate. And generally speaking, they need about two days in order to overcome that veto period. They need about uh, uh, you know, because the bill's got to go back to the House and then the Senate to overcome that veto period. So they have a two-week veto period. And so with them having to be out by April, you know, mid-April there, April 15th, that veto period is going to come at the end of this month uh, because they only have, after all, 18 days left of session. And so with 18 days left of session, you would say, wow, they must have gotten a lot done so far. You would be mistaken. Now, there's a lot of bills uh, set to pass and a lot of bills they're working on. But so far, the only two bills after uh, 42 days of session, the only two bills that have gotten passed has been uh, a bill to deal with election finance issue to really help out those who are, of course, legislators, those who are trying to, uh, you know, help out those who run for office. So clearly a bill for them. And then also now we have the other bill that they finally passed, and that would be Senate Bill 5. And for those of you who don't remember, we talked about Senate Bill 5. It was one of the bills they took the earliest action on at the beginning of the year. Senate Bill 5, uh, the House passed, their first bill passed out of the House, first bill, real bill passed out of the Senate. Both of them were uh, uh, mere bills that did the same thing. And it was undoing something that they passed last year. So last year, the legislature supposedly unknowingly because which the fact that they didn't know that they were passing this tells me that they don't read the legislation. Not a giant shocker. I mean, I was on a uh, kind of like a Twitter space. Well, I'm not kind of. It was a Twitter space recently. And for those of you who have no idea what a Twitter space is, uh, that is basically like a like a group call, but a public group call that 
is on Twitter. So that just kind of gives you some idea of what that is. So I was on a Twitter space recently and we were discussing about how legislators don't read the legislation before them. And we talked about how it's it's just really not possible. First, they pass a lot of legislation, generally speaking in a year, not a lot, but there's a lot of bills they vote on. I mean, while I said that only two bills have passed, both the House and Senate, there's been somewhere around 150, 175 bills that have passed one of the two chambers. Even if we split that in half, that's like 75 bills. And these bills are multiple pages long, they all deal with different things. On top of that, they've had a lot of hearings and bills that have passed committees. So if we've passed 150 or so bills out of uh, one of the houses, the House or the Senate, you got to think there's probably another 100 or so bills, 50 or so bills potentially uh, that have also passed in a committee that a person would have to educate themselves on. And so our entire legislative process is kind of set up where committee members are supposed to be the ones that really dig into whether a bill's good or bad, and then they can pass it or not pass it out of committee, but then they kind of inform the rest of their caucus on what to do on the bill, whether the bill's good or bad. And it's a way of kind of separating out whose job it is to know what's in the bills. But what ends up happening is a lot of legislators end up relying on people who aren't very good to know what's in their bills, and that doesn't control, too, people lying to you. I mean, there are plenty of times where we see legislators, we see the actors that are involved uh, with this legislation literally making up and lying about what a bill does in order to get people to vote for it. And that's why one of the things I've always said, if we want to see a big change and a big difference with our legislation, with our government, with our legislators and what they're passing, what we need to provide them as citizens is the backup and support of people who read and pay attention to what's in bills because they are one person who's trying to follow along with what's going on. And what happens is, is of course, leadership and others, uh, they have assistance, a bill writer. They've got a lot more staff at their disposal than the average legislator does. The average legislator has a, a secretary that they share with like three to four other legislators. They just don't have a lot of people to kind of help them go through the bills. They do have bill writers that they can ask to write a bill, but who's interpreting what's in a bill for them? Well, it's falling a lot of times the leadership to the, to the caucus whip uh, and so on and so forth. So that is why bad pieces of legislation can get passed that nobody read. Is it right? Is it wrong? I mean, my argument here would be is that maybe we should just do less. We should ask our government to do less so that way legislators can fully understand everything they're passing. Um, but there's plenty of times where I read bills that, I, that I've read and I'll sit there and say, I have no idea what this bill exactly does because it's very specialized to a specific industry, especially healthcare a lot of times. You know, bills that do things like oh, reclassify this center to another center or talk about Medicaid, Medicare classifications for billings and as such, you know, those types of things, unless you're in that industry, it's hard for you to know what the bill's practical uh, uh, problem is. So this bill, uh, Senate Bill 5 that has become law, was undoing a bill that they passed last year on accident that had a provision in it that uh, said you couldn't fish or hunt on your own property without a license unless you had more than five acres. So if you had a pond on your property, but you had less than five acres, or you had a little stand set up on your property, but you had less than five acres, you still had to get a hunting license to hunt and fish on your own property. That was something apparently the legislators never meant to do, but it was slipped into the bill. So they had to pass this Senate Bill 5, the second bill, thing to come law this session in order to undo the piece of legislation that they passed towards the end of last year. So that gives you some idea of what's kind of going on up there, but we'll be digging into uh, an article after this put out by LGBTQ news site called Them about Kentucky law. We'll be going over that after this short break. You're listening to The Andrew Cooper Writer Show, your source for Kentucky politics. And you are back with the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, your source for Kentucky politics. So recently, in our, a uh, news site called Them, if you've ever heard of it, I had never heard of it till now, though the fact that um, 
they go by the name them should be a pretty good indication, wrote a pretty conspiratorial article, um, to say the least, right? So, you know, if we remember how, how these far lefties will call out conspiratorial things that we've said or done and be like, you're too conspiratorial on that. I mean, a great example would be something I talked about yesterday where they call us out for connecting too many dots, dots that really don't take that much effort to connect. So yesterday I talked about uh, early on, for those who listened, the tornado bus line uh, about how it's been running a route um, to Lexington, to parts of Louisville, to parts, well, we didn't know this. I talked about how I saw a bus, tornado bus line, dropping off a large group of Hispanic people in a random parking lot in the Hispanic part of Lexington. And I did some research on the bus line, and it's well known for transporting uh, illegal immigrants. And that was a, a story I talked about yesterday that I saw. So I did a little more digging into this bus line. And keep in mind, okay, this bus is dropping off into the middle of nowhere. That means it doesn't have a bus terminal. It means it doesn't have, uh, like Greyhound in Lexington has a terminal. Greyhound in like Louisville has a terminal, right? Normally bus lines will have terminal terminals where people, you know, can wait for like a transfer or a wait over or a stop over, those kinds of things. When they're coming into an area and they're really doing a lot of uh, this work with busing, it's kind of like airplanes, right? Where they'll have places and terminals where people kind of wait and transfer buses and things like that. Well, they don't have that in Lexington, this tornado bus line. So they're just dropping off into a parking lot. And then on top of that, they're dropping off. And I posted this picture talking about this on social media. And a lot of other people commented saying that they've been noticing this same bus line dropping off loads of Hispanic people in Louisville, in Northern Kentucky, um, and other parts just into random parking lots. Now, it's very possible that this is a standard normal bus running a normal bus route that they've suddenly just set up and, and ran. And, and not a single person coming off that bus is a legal immigrant. They're just running a, a bus line from Texas to Kentucky for whatever reason, okay? Uh, all of a sudden, they, they suddenly need to be running a bus from Texas to Kentucky, which is generally where they're coming from, um, and all of a sudden, Northern Kentucky, Louisville, and Lexington, none of us noticed it before. Uh, they weren't doing this, you know, up until, you know, certainly pretty recently, they just started doing this. But everybody on there is completely legal and okay and everything else. It still leads us to questions, good questions, questions that we should be asking, such as, what has happened in our country recently that a bus line, this tornado bus line, that is well known for transporting illegal immigrants, that when you go to their website is completely in Spanish. It's not even in English. The entire bus line is in Spanish. Like it's meant to be for Spanish speaking people to ride. So what has happened that has created a, a quote unquote market opening then for people who speak Spanish as their first language, English as a second language. So ESL people, specifically Hispanic people who speak Spanish to have a desire and need for them to run bus lines to random parking lots in Kentucky, such a desire and need that when they decided to do this, they didn't even have a terminal to be running to, right? What's happened? And we should be able to ask that question, have that conversation, but we can't do that without being called conspiratorial or crazy because I posted about that on social media. And what did I get told by the lefties? I'm conspiratorial and crazy. Well, we have this article from this LGBTQ news website, Them, which in and of itself is extremely conspiratorial. And what the article says in the title, and you've started now to see a very similar titles for different articles wrote by different people popping up on places like Yahoo News and other places. And the title is, A new bill could allow Kentucky to take custody of kids using the wrong school bathroom. And so what's going on here? So are, are they saying that our legislature is proposing a bill that says that, um, you know, if a parent allows their child or encourages their child or pushes their child to use the bathroom of the opposite sex, that then the, the state is going to step in and take their kids away from them. Is that what the bill says? No, that bill isn't moving forward. Um, 
you know, is that a good bill or a bad bill? We can have some discussion on that, but that isn't what the bill says. What does the bill that they're they're trying to attack and say is a bad bill actually have to do with? What dots are they connecting? Well, the first dot that they're connecting is a, a bill in 2023, Senate Bill 150. And you guys may remember this. I mention this bill all the time. It was a big piece of legislation that was a sweeping youth, old, specifically trans uh, bill that said, look, you can't do surgeries on minors, uh, gender transition surgeries on minors. You can't give them life altering, uh, and, and chemical castration drugs, uh, schools. And this is a part of it. Schools can't have, uh, kids going into uh, a bathroom other than their biological sex. And this has led a lot of schools to, uh, try to buck this law in a lot of different ways. We're seeing Fayette County public schools under a lot of pressure for their new school's construction to make sure that they are gender-neutral bathroom, non-gender-specific bathrooms. But anyway, so they're taking that bill that has that rule and law about kids using the right bathroom, and then they're connecting that to the dot of a bill that was just passed committee, and that is House Bill 747. Now, what 747 does is it adds educational, uh, uh, adds definitions to educational neglect for a reason to remove a child from a home. Okay. That's, that's all it does. So it's already against the law or it's already a part of law that when a, a parent isn't, uh, quote unquote, educating their kid properly, um, or caring about their kid's education. Basically, if a, if a, if, if a parent isn't homeschooling their kid, um, isn't taking them to school, isn't doing anything to teach them at all, and just basically letting them run wild like an animal through the woods at night and then come back for dinner and a place to sleep, and that's pretty much it. Well, that would be considered, while they're not beating the kid, they're feeding the kid, they're taking care of all their basic needs, they are still neglecting them in an educational sense, and so that would be educational neglect. And that's already in our Kentucky law to be a reason to take a person away from their parent. What they're adding, okay, uh, is this specific line and, and adding this to the current definition. So this is what the bill says, okay? Educational neglect, which shall include a parent's failure to properly supervise, instruct, train, or control his or her child, and that failure is a substantial contributing factor to the child's violation of the school board's code of acceptable behavior and discipline adopted under KRS Chapter 158. And so what they're saying here is that a child that continues... That educational neglect can include a parent not properly disciplining their child. Basically, if you have a kid that is causing a lot of problems at school, what do you do with them, right? Because it's very difficult for us to just kick kids out of public school. I mean, that used to be a thing. It used to be a thing that if a kid was really bad, you could say, nope, he can't come to the school anymore. But that stopped being a thing uh, because, you know, quote unquote, every child's got a right to go to uh, a public school. And of course, that's what the left believes. And so because of that, that and maybe you believe that, too. There's nothing wrong with that. But because of that, they said, well, we have to go ahead then and and. We can't kick kids out. We can suspend them or whatever if they do something wrong, but we can't. It's hard for us to, to really remove kids. Kids have to be truly, truly awful and terrible. But what if a kid does keep getting into fights and so he keeps getting kicked out of school? Or what if a kid is constantly truant? Or what if a kid uh, uh, is literally just not showing up to class? Or what if a kid is constantly causing issues in the classroom, which isn't just making it difficult on other children, but also making it difficult on the child themselves to succeed in school. I mean, so often you hear us saying, well, the problem here is that we can't, we don't have good parents and government can't replace good parents, that these parents need to start taking care of their kids. These parents need to start taking responsibility because at the end of the day, that's the biggest problem here. The reason why kids and the vast majority of kids are doing bad in school or other things is grow up to be hoodlums is because the parents have failed in one way or another. This became a recent discussion uh, with that ruling out of what was it? Um, Michigan, I believe, or yeah, or Illinois. Anyway, where that there was that school shooting and the parents got charged 
with murder charges and found guilty uh, for murder charges because their child executed a school shooting. And it wasn't like they handed them the gun. It's not like they knew that the kid was, was going to go do this and didn't stop him. It was simply they said, you neglected to take care of this kid properly. Therefore, you are held accountable. And we talked about how you know, that thought process of holding parents legally accountable for what their kids have done. What is our, our cutoff here? When, what is the logical conclusion of that? Because if we look at every single criminal in jail, they probably don't have the vast majority, like 99% of them, I would bet, or 90, very high percentage came from broken homes, came from a bad living situation, abusive home. Basically, they just had cruddy parents. Of course they did. That's why they ended up having a criminal for a child, because they were a bad parent. They didn't do the right thing. Most of the time, not saying that there's never been a criminal that grew up in a very normal, straightforward household, but most of the time, that's the reason why. And so this bill's attempting to deal with that. But of course, them, this LGBTQ news is having an issue. So we'll be continuing this discussion. We're coming up on a break. We'll, we'll kind of wrap this up uh, after this short break. You're listening to The Andrew Cooper Writer Show, your source for Kentucky politics. Want to reach out to the show? Feel free to email info at theandrewshow.com. Once again, that's info at theandrewshow.com. And you are back with The Andrew Cooper Writer Show. Before the break, we were talking about a them article, a them article, uh, which is an LGBTQ publication called A New Bill Could Allow Kentucky to Take Custody of Kids Using the Wrong School Bathroom. We were talking about what conspiracy dots are these uh, LGBTQ activists connecting in order to come up with this claim. Well, I'd mentioned that obviously they're they're taking, not obviously, of course, but they're taking Senate Bill 150, which passed in 2023, which makes uh, it against school rules, basically, or schools cannot allow kids of the uh, opposite sex of a, or kids to go to a bathroom that does not coincide with their biological sex. Um, and then they're, they're putting that together with another bill that has come out, um, which is House Bill uh, was it? House Bill 747. And House Bill 747 would add a, a definitions to, net, to educational neglect as a reason to remove a child from custody. And what this, what that is trying to deal with is these parents that are absolutely not doing their job at all. They're not punishing their kids, so they're acting like a bunch of hoodlums on the bus. They're not punishing their kids, so they're acting like jerks at school. They're not ta- punishing their kids, so they're not doing well at school. They're not spending the time to work with their kids, so they're not being educated on how to act in public and also getting the help they need at home on these types of subjects. And, and this is trying to take those extreme cases and deal with them and fix the problem that government at the end of the day, no matter how much money we dump into schools, no matter how much money we dump into early childhood education, no matter how much money we dump into any number of these boondoggles, it does not matter because the government cannot replace a good parent. The government can't replace parents at all. And so rather than trying to replace the parents with government, say, look, we're going to be holding these parents accountable if they're bad parents. Now, of course, taking kids away from somebody and saying, we're going to take kids away and then put them into the foster system. You better have a pretty compelling case. And I think this takes a lot of research and study that somehow this foster system or removing of custody uh, will result in a better situation because that that's always the question, right? Because there is a lot of value to a child being with their biological parents, even if their biological parents aren't so good. There's a tipping point here, right? So for an example, uh, even if a biological uh, parent is not that great in let's say a custody situation and it'd be, and you may think it'd be better or a lot of people may think it'd be better if the if the kid never saw that parent. Well, it could be a situation where actually there is a cutoff where even if that's a cruddy parent, it's still good for the child to have some exposure to them just because, you know, that's their other parent. And there's some biological needs there. There's some other things going on there. And so we really have to have to say, at what point does educational neglect become so bad 
that you'd be better off into a foster system. Now, maybe you could see something like, look, you know, uh, the kid, we can look at the kid going to his grandparents for a little while or the other parent, if there's a, a father, mother broken up situation and, and the father's willing to take the kid or the mother's willing to take the kid saying because of educational neglect, we're going to take the kid from this parent, give it to the other parent. You know, you could see those situations where the level of how bad do they have to be before foster, before you know, taking kids away makes sense, uh, would be a pretty low bar potentially where the child isn't, you know, going through the radicalness of the foster care system. But I would imagine, and, and I think many of you would have to agree that a, a parent would have to be pretty darn awful when it comes to educational neglect for a child to be better off in a foster care system or in, um, you know, this state, uh, child custody system. It, it would have to be some pretty extreme, quote unquote, educational neglect. And of course, I would say that extreme neglect, and, and I would be hard pressed to find a judge or anything that does this, a, a, a trans kid using the wrong bathroom, a guy going into a girl's bathroom, that to be a reason to take away custody, I just, I don't, I just don't think we live in a world where that conceivably happens. I almost wish we lived in a world where that was the worst thing we needed to worry about. That was the thing that was destroying our society the most. Do I think this, you know, kids using the wrong bathroom and buying into this lie that men can become women is a part of what's destroying society? A hundred percent I do. I think it's more of a symptom of what's destroying our society, which is a complete lack of moral clarity and moral values. And this is one of them, along with kids just fighting in school, along with uh, uh, kids not putting value on, on, you know, behaving right and parents not putting value on being a parent and not taking that role and responsibility as extremely important. I do think that has a lot of problems and leads to a lot of problems in our modern society. That being stated... Um, I don't think that this is the most, quote unquote, biggest, most dangerous outcropping is that if a law gets passed, a law has been passed saying a kid can't use the same biological bathroom and then a parent enables a child to keep ignoring that rule because they're buying into this gender agenda craziness. I, I, I don't know if that's quite as bad as kids that are constantly slinging drugs at school and getting into fights and violently attacking others. I do think it's bad. Don't, don't misunderstand. I think that's awful. And I think the parent of that child is a bad parent. And if we were at a point in society where I think that was the worst outcropping of this idea that we have that, uh, you know, that, that a lack of moral clarity is what's leading to our problems. I could see a situation where that kids using the wrong bathroom coupled with forcing drugs down their throat, coupled with a brainwashing situation when it comes to this gender bending nonsense could lead to parents losing custody of their kids. I could see that being a situation that I could see happening where I would say, yeah, that makes sense because they are abusing their kid. They're not treating their mental illness properly. Or in fact, they're trying to push a mental illness onto their child, you know, like a, like a, was it Munchausen by proxy syndrome? right? Uh, where they're forcing that on their kid. And I think that's awful. And I think that is abuse. And eventually we should be t talking about that when we get to that point of conversation where these are parents that want to abuse the kids and not just confused because society is pumping this into them. Hopefully I'm making sense there. But anyways, the idea though, that kids using bathrooms is going to lead, that's absolutely ridiculous. And it's never happened. We know it's never happened. We know it's never happened that a school has consistently punished a child for going in the wrong bathroom without making other situations for them, giving them a private bathroom for them to use, giving them access to a teacher bathroom or something like that. So they just don't go into either gender bathroom. Uh, we just know that's the case. That it hasn't happened. How do we know that? Because we haven't seen an article on it. I mean, do you really think in the world we live in, in this media situation we live in, that if anywhere in the country even there had been a child that by state law was forbid from going into 
uh, if they're a dude going into a girl's bathroom or a girl going into a dude's bathroom and they decide to take a political stance on it and then the school punishes them for doing that and, and, and everything else. Do you not think that'd become like a national story? Because, of course, the mother and parent of that child would be calling it into every news station trying to get their five minutes of fame, and they would cover it because it fits the agenda. Oh, look at these mean, old, awful Republicans. They're doing mean, old, awful things. It fits that agenda. It just does. And so it's quite, if, if that had happened at all, at all, anywhere in the nation, we'd be hearing about it. So I think this is completely, completely, Absolutely, 100% a conspiratorial thought that this them LGBTQ newspapers had about Kentucky, where all of a sudden parents that are sending their kids into the wrong bathroom at school are going to end up losing custody left and right. Like I said, I, I, at some point, I wish we lived in a society where that was the case, where that was one of the worst things that was happening with kids, and we had a judicial system and a society that recognized how damaging that was to kids, and that was the most damaging thing going on for kids right now where that would happen. But we're nowhere near there. That's not going to happen. It's ridiculous. But what have you. Well, after this, we're going to be going over a few more bills that are on the move in our legislature and uh, some other things to expect over these last 18 session days. You're listening to The Andrew Cooper Writer Show, your source for Kentucky politics. We'll be back in a few, few short minutes. And you are back with The Andrew Cooper Writer Show, your source for Kentucky politics. So... Back in 2020, during uh, the height of the COVID craziness, we had, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement rally protests slash riots occur. And obviously, there was a a lot of that going on in Kentucky with the uh, death of Breonna Taylor. And a part of all that going on, there was a situation that occurred in our state legislature. And is that that moment that uh, Bashir decided to initiate the tearing down and removal of the Jefferson Davis statue from the Capitol Rotunda. And there was a commission on, um, you know, on statue on commission on historical statues or uh, capital commission or some commission uh, that was in charge of whether or not that statue could be removed or not. Now, remember, Bashir did a lot of shady things around the statue removal. Uh, Apparently, he started the process before the committee actually took the vote. He also issued a gigantic inflated like hundreds of thousands of dollars um, no bid contract to a campaign donor to remove said statue, which obviously that raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, so he kind of started the process and he awarded the contract before they actually voted. But this historical properties commission, I believe that's what it's called, um, took a vote and decided to remove the statue. And This year, we see a bill making its way through the legislature that would take the power of deciding about statue removal, art removal, those kinds of things in the Capitol Rotunda away from the properties uh, commission. Now, the way the Capitol is typically working, this is what's so messed up. So um, the first floor is controlled when you go into the Capitol building. That first floor is controlled by the governor. And then the second floor. And third floors are controlled by the legislature. They get control of the second and third floors. And Bashir is in charge of the first floor, which is why you had like weird situations during 2021 where, you know, all the Republican legislators or almost all of them, basically all of them never wore masks, didn't wear masks when in the legislature, didn't buy into that nonsense. But yet there was still a mass mandate walking into the Capitol building because the uh, uh, Bashir had control on that first floor. So you could walk through wearing a mask the minute you got through security, which also is a joke because you're allowed to carry firearms in the Capitol. So I have no idea why they have a quote unquote security. But anyways, the minute you walk through security, they then could go ahead and say, yep, you're good. Uh, you've walked through security and you can now remove your mask. I mean, they wouldn't come out and say you can now remove your mask, but you could remove your mask and nobody would take you out because Bashir was in charge of KSP at the entrance, but he wasn't in charge of the entire building. 
And so the legislature is removing Bashir and and because he has appointing power on this commission. So the governor's office basically threw the properties commission from being in charge of uh, this statue removal. And so now in order to get under this bill, anything removed, it would have to go through the legislature. The legislature would be in control of what gets removed or not removed. Now, of course they claim the legislators will claim that this is nothing to do with the Jefferson Davis statue. You don't need to worry about it, blah, 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 because they're just trying to, they don't want to wade into the fight of over whether or not statue removals are a good thing or not. So they're just like, look, we'll just stay away from it uh, completely as much as we can. And so that bill's on the move. We've got another bill that's on the move, Senate Bill 325. This is a shell bill that's moving through. So it was uh, labeled to be called up for a committee. For those of you who are unaware of what shell bills are, I've explained it a few times on the show. But a shell bill is a bill that does something innocuous, like in this case, um, this bill changes some gender neutral language in some certain parts of uh, the laws there. And so this is being called into a committee where they will then submit a committee sub. So, you know, shell bills are used by leadership to ignore their self-imposed bill filing deadline. So, and it happened last week, there's a bill filing deadline. So legislators can no longer file bills in the House and Senate. And so that bill filing deadline occurs. Well, we have a process in our system where when you go into a committee, you can substitute a bill for a committee sub, which will change what the bill says. Now, many times committee subs are used to make a minor adjustment. This process exists mainly. So if you're bringing a bill into committee, you're talking to, you've proposed the bill first, it's gotten assigned to a committee so you know who to lobby, and then you start lobbying or talking to members of that committee to get them to vote yes on your bill, and you find out that you can get a you know four or five yes votes, you can get enough yes votes to pass, but you need to make this small change to the bill. Well, the bill's already been proposed and wrote. So you need to make that change. And so what they offer is a committee substitute that then gets adopted that makes whatever small change, generally small change that needed to be made in order to get buy-in from the rest of the members of that committee. But that process can also be used and abused to completely change what a bill says. So Senate Bill 325 is a shell bill, innocuous, changes, like I said, some gender terminology and laws. Well, that comes in. Well, then they submit a committee sub that can be a bill that does something hugely different, right? It can, it can literally be a completely new bill. And the thing about that is that means that legislatively, when this happens, that the grassroots and constituents, the people who, you know, legislators are supposed to be representing, have no idea what the bill that will be called before a committee actually is. How can you be representing the people? How can you be representing your constituents if they can't even see what you're going to be voting on to give you their opinion? But of course, that's probably by design. So we have that working its way through the uh, House House and, and Senate as well, that bill working its way through. And then um, that's shell bills. So there's some over in the House too. Sorry, you got to be keeping an eye on. So we'll try to keep you abreast of everything that's going on there. Um, let's see. Last week, we had the baby Olivia bill hearing uh, occur in the Health Standing Committee on Health Services. We're going to be digging in more to that tomorrow, but that, of course, uh, is a bill that's had a lot of pushback from the left because it's a, it's a they call it a anti-abortion video that they want to require to be shown in schools, but we'll be going over what that video exactly is in showing and the reason why it's a good thing. We should be able to to see how children develop in the womb. And if seeing that means you suddenly don't want to murder them anymore, well, so be it. That's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Um, I did cover last week uh, House Bill 500. That was a bill that the media was representing greatly a part of it about those lunch breaks. And, and I dug into that and I talked about that. But word is, is that House Bill uh, 500 is pretty much dead, which just points to what our media is doing. I mean, it just, it completely points to uh, the very problem that we have with our current legislature. And that is that 
or not our legislature, our media system. And, and that is that they completely misrepresent things. So they take a bill and they say, oh, this is going to be limiting lunch breaks. And I, and I dug into this. And what it was doing was very intricately, smartly, intelligently taking a look at a problem that everybody is breaking labor laws all across Kentucky, like in every single office. They're breaking labor laws. How do we fix this to where they're not breaking labor laws anymore? How do we fix this and adjust this? That was the question. And instead of allowing this problem to be fixed, where we've got all these office businesses that are unknowingly breaking labor laws, instead of fixing that, what do we do? We allow this problem to languish and continue because the media came out and started labeling the bill as getting rid of lunch breaks. And so because they didn't go over what problem the bill was, was fixing, it was, an intra it was a good fix to a real problem. But then our media represents it, misrepresents it for clicks and to fit their liberal agenda, because if they had it their way, you know, the, nobody would work. I mean, a lot of these people, everybody would be free to pursue whatever weird leftist ideology they want to pursue. And then that would be it. If they had it their way, they don't want anybody to work. So anything that at all changes anything on, on working laws that they don't think is going to mean people work less, they're going to throw a fit about, even though this bill wasn't really taking away lunch breaks at all. It was fixing a real problem. But anyways, that's what we have time for today on the Andrew Cooperator Show. I thank you all so, so much for tuning in. We'll see you back here tomorrow. We'll be going over that baby Olivia hearing tomorrow. I hope you have a great rest of your day. The views.